have a guest speaker today who is helping uh, out with the Springs Academy program. Uh, I normally teach this one, but we actually have a master here today, Rob Master, we we'll call him Rob Madsen. Uh, he's the, the biologist who's probably done more work on springs biology than anybody else in the last 20 some years. Uh, he worked formerly at the Swan River Water Management District as their chief biologist, and now he's at the St. John River Water Management District, and continuing to conduct really detailed uh, spring and sea biological studies. And so, really fortunate to have Rob here. And Rob, feel free to introduce yourself more if you want. Alrighty. Well, yeah, I'm kind of glad to be back in my old stomping ground, see some old friends, and, and uh, and folks that I know. So uh, I was asked to give you uh, the um, biology lecture in the, in the Springs Academy, um, and uh, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So um, we, will, we will get into it. Basic layout of a spring. Uh, you've got the spring itself, the pool area, which is what we see when we see the spring. Um, typically, one or more vents, the openings in the limestone, out of which the groundwater issues. Um, the boil, which technically is the turbulence, the water turbulence, over the vents, although some folks refer to the whole head spring as the boil, which is okay. Um, the run, which if it's long enough, usually has a name all its own, like Wakiva River or Ishtuckney River. Uh, and then some type of a submerged cave system. So those are the basic habitats of a, of a spring. The ecological values of springs, we're going to dwell on these quite a bit in this talk. Uh, extensive submerged aquatic vegetation beds, I'll show you quite a bit of data on that. Uh, they provide a thermal refuge, uh, warm water for manatees, cool water for striped bass. We'll touch on that a little bit. We'll talk about some of the endemic fauna. Um, springs, may, particularly here in North Florida, they keep our streams flowing during the dry seasons. You know, we've, we had an exceptionally dry winter and spring, and I was out on a number of our St. John's spring runs this spring, and they were all spring water. I mean, there was no surface water runoff because it was so dry. And they add what I call landscape scale diversity. So those are some of the overall ecological values of springs. When we talk about springs biology, these are the things we're going to be going through. The primary producers, which are the aquatic plants, uh, submerged and emergent, and then the various consumer groups, the benthic invertebrates and fish and other vertebrates. And we'll talk a little bit about ecosystem function, ecosystem metabolism, and then I'll try to kind of put it all together for you. Uh, in, in a way that ecologists view uh, ecosystems, which really H.T. Odom, the namesake of, of this institute, sort of helped uh, pioneer. So aquatic plants. Um, in springs and spring runs, uh, we've got several major groups of aquatic plants. We've got these very simple plants called algae, uh, which consist of a number of very simple plants. They don't have roots or stems or leaves. They don't reproduce by seeds or flowers. Uh, but even the algae includes a diverse number of groups. You've got diatoms, you've got the cyanobacteria, which used to be called blue-green algae, if you're old enough. You've got other algae groups, the green algae, the chlorophyta, and the yellow-green algae. Most of these are filamentous, some kind of a stringy type growth form, although cara, which is a green alga, actually looks like a higher plant, a macrophyte. And then, actually, in the spring runs, we get a couple of species of, of red algae. These are mostly marine, estuarine-type algae, but there are a couple of freshwater species. And here in Florida, they tend to like the spring runs. We, we collect those in the spring runs. We do get some true mosses in the genus Fontanalis, in the, the, the bryophytes, the, the true mosses. So we do get some of those. And then, most noticeably, we get the flowering rooted vascular plants, a variety of native species here, and then plus some, some exotics, which you, you might be familiar with, hydrilla probably being the most infamous. So those are the submerged plants living totally underwater. And then we get various emergent plants growing along the margins of the spring pool or along the spring run. Uh, and in the floodplains, if, if the spring has a, a floodplain that floods regularly, various emergent plants, uh, three major growth forms, you get true floating plants like water hyacinth, which is an exotic, water lettuce, and the duckweeds. And then you get 
emergent plants which are rooted in the bottom, but they send up a petiole and then they have some type of a floating leaf, a water lily, spatter dock, water penny, your lily pad kind of things. And then your true emergent plants that just grow out of the water, uh, herbaceous things like pickerel weed and cattail, shrubs like swamp rose and button bush, and then trees like bald cypress and Carolina ash or pop ash. The um, ecological roles, the value of aquatic plants, the biggie is the first bullet. They are what we call primary producers. They produce organic carbon, you know, living biomass, from sun energy and inorganic elements like carbon dioxide. And that's what's consumed by, you know, on up the, uh, up the food chain, which I'll conclude with by showing you. And the plant production in aquatic ecosystems, some of it is consumed live, and some is still valuable food material after it dies and begins to decay. So this primary production is consumed as both live and dead plant material. Of course, if you're an angler, you know the plants provide structure, structural habitat for animals to, to live in. Um, and then they stabilize the sediments of the banks and, and the bottom. Some examples here, and in this case I've defaulted to the scientific names, I'm not using the common names. Probably the two most common species are um, spring tape or strap leaf sage, which is Sagittaria curziana, and freshwater eelgrass or wild celery, which is Valisneria americana, val. Uh, you can see they've got those strap like leaf blades which help them deal with the current in the spring run. Some of the other plants are sago pondweed, uh, potamogeton. This is water moss with the snail alemia. And then this is cara in the foreground, which this is a green alga, not a, not a, not a flowering plant. You can see all of, uh, this is a moss, but all of these plants produce flowers and seeds. Um, I'll show you some data by way of talking a little more about the plants of spring run streams. We're going to focus mainly on the submerged vegetation because I'll show you a graph. That really is the dominant vegetation in spring runs. The emergent stuff is important, really could use some more scientific study, but it's not really a major component of, uh, of the spring run primary producer community. And the ways we typically sample submerged vegetation use some type of a frame of known area. In this case, this is a quarter meter square quadrat. Um, and we can sample either non-destructively, just by estimating cover, the cover of the plant community, or you can actually take plant material and take it back to the laboratory and analyze it. Either clip the leaves or actually pull out the leaves and the roots. So we call it destructive sampling. Um, but that's, that's some of the ways we do it. Um, in particular, uh, I'm involved in the springtime. I do um, submerged vegetation again, SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation. I do SAV surveys in a number of St. John's spring runs. In this case, I'll show you as an example uh, Silver Glen. This is Silver Glen Spring, Silver Glen Run. It empties into Lake George uh, on the uh, middle St. John's River area. Um, we had a contractor do some monitoring for a while, but since 2009, we in-house with staff, with me and other staff that I can get to help me, um, we've been monitoring the green uh, transects. So this is transect one, and that's transect 10, right near the confluence with, with Lake George. And we go across the stream channel, we take five of those quarter meter square quads and, and estimate plant cover in, uh, in each of those. And there's some of the data. Um, so these are the stations again, transect one up at the head spring, transect 10. We estimate cover using a scale called the Braun Blanquet scale. Um, one is less than 5% cover, five is 75 to 100% cover. And we use that because it's a very commonly used uh, vegetation monitoring technique. And it, it's very easy to do and it's reliable. You can do the same thing from year to year. So you get a good consistent data set. The main thing is uh, you, we kind of get a spatial trend that, that plant cover, and this is just val. This is the, as I'll show you a map in a bit. This is the dominant plant, submerged plant in Silver Glen. Um, you can kind of see cover increases as you go downstream towards Lake George. Uh, very little val cover up at those head spring areas. 
And that's because if you've ever been to Silver Glen, you know it's one of the few spring runs where they still let boats come in. So folks come in and they, you know, anchor on the sandbar here and party and then they go to the spring run. And of course this is the day use area, so a lot of folks come in from the land side. So there's a lot of physical disturbance up in these first two or three transects and the boat disturbance. And that's why the, uh, the valve cover is, is reduced there. Ordinarily it would be pretty much high all the way right up to the, to the head spring area. Um, a, 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 you notice too that some of my more recent monitoring surveys looks like higher cover. So if you collapse all these 10 transects to an annual average, you can see that we're kind of getting a general increase in cover on, uh, on Silver Glen. The reason I think that is, is I think somewhere around here, the Lake County Commission passed an ordinance that prohibits uh, alcohol open containers on Silver Glen Run. Um, it's kind of weird. Silver Spring or Silver Glen Springs itself, the head spring is in Marion County, but the county line, the Marion County Lake County line, is here. Runs right north south through here. You know, if you ever canoed on here, there's a little sign about here that says entering Lake County. So most of the run is in Lake County. So they prohibited alcohol on the run. It gives law enforcement uh, the authority to go and inspect coolers and that kind of thing. And I understand from the folks who manage the day use area that it really has kind of cut back on the partying and, and uh, a lot of the really wild stuff there. So that's probably why we're getting that increase. We're just not getting the boat traffic in the run now. Um, algae cover. We actually have a couple of extra years because I mentioned a contractor initially set this network up and then we've continued it and we've incorporated uh, monitoring the macrophytes as well as the algae. I'll admit that we're getting so much data, uh, nine years of data now, that this graph is almost uninterpretable. Um, but basically algae cover is pretty high throughout the spring run. Again, it kind of tails off at those head spring transects because of the physical disturbance from recreational use. Again, if you collapse the transects to an annual mean, you can see no real trend. Algae cover is just staying up there in Silver Glen Run. Um, here's some, uh, instead of cover data, now this is a project we did a couple of years ago at the district. We uh, had a contractor survey 14 spring run streams, not only along the St. John's, but they actually went and did like Wikiwachi and Manatee Springs and such. In this case, they actually took plant samples, they clipped the leaf biomass, took it back to the lab and dried it and they got a dry weight per unit area. These are the number of species of, uh, of aquatic plants that they got in their sampling units, in their quadrats. But they did a sampling in the spring and they did a sampling in the fall and these are just some of the statistics, minimum, maximum, mean and median, which are about the same thing, a measure of the average value. Main thing here is notice that the fall values quite a bit higher than the spring uh, because the growing season for the smurge vegetation is that late spring, early summer. So we're kind of seeing and then they kind of die back during the fall and so you get reduced uh, uh, biomass in the spring from that winter, winter dieback. And then you can see the summer regrowth. So there's another way of looking. And then we also map submerge vegetation. Um, this is from mapping studies conducted in a number of spring run streams here in, in North Florida. And when you do this, first you've got to delineate out your whole stream, the bank and the stream bottom. And then you go and you do, you map your submerged vegetation on that, on that base map. So what you can calculate is what percent of the total stream bottom is actually vegetated with these submerged grass beds. And in most spring runs, it's half or more of the total bottom area as supports these um, submerged grass beds. So it really is a significant habitat in these clear water uh, spring run streams. If you've ever been on Juniper Creek or Rock Springs Run, these are very narrow spring runs with usually fairly dense tree canopy cover. So the, the lack of light, the shading, that's why we don't get quite as much uh, SAV cover on these. But here's some different mapping uh, efforts. This is Ishtuckney River, uh, not too far away. Back in 1979, uh, Charles Dutois did his master's thesis on Ishtuckney. And if you're familiar with that, he was looking at recreational impacts on submerged vegetation beds in the Ishtuckney. And it was really based on 
uh, his data, his results, that the park instituted the um, limits on how many folks, how many tubers can go down the river, mainly to, to help protect uh, the SAV beds. But Charlie mapped, uh, and this was the old timey, he went out with graph paper and a tape, and he went down the whole length of the Ishtuckney from the head spring to 27 at the south takeout there, and he mapped submerged vegetation. So these were his figures, total acres, in the kind of the three major reaches of the Ishtuckney uh, in the park, the head spring reach, the rice marsh reach, where it gets broad and you got those wild rice marshes, and then the floodplain reach. When I was at Swanee, uh, we had a contractor go out and remap using um, sophisticated GPS technology, but really it's very comparable to the way Charlie mapped uh, the SAV back then. And you can see really nice increases in acreage uh, in the Ishtuckney, and we really think that's due to the park's careful management and stewardship of, of the resource in terms of uh, limits on recreation. Getting as many folks as they can on the river, but uh, trying to do so to um, uh, protect these submerged grass beds, which are such an important habitat. Probably the Rainbow River has had more mapping done on it than uh, any other spring run stream, mainly funded by the Southwest Florida District. About every five, six years or, go, or so since the um, uh, mid-90s, they, they've mapped uh, vegetation, both submerged and emergent on the Rainbow River. You can see in terms of acres, um, it's the submerged stuff that really dominates the plant community in, in Rainbow River. Uh, the acreage of emergent vegetation, much, much smaller, a um, little maybe disturbing. It seemed like SAV was humming along there for a while, but we got a bit of a dip in 2011. And I do not know, they're at about at that five or six year, so I don't know if they're redoing this now. Um, is, is this kind of an interactive presentation, or do you want us to save the questions for the end? Let's, let's try saving okay. for the end, because i got a lot to gotcha. show you. But I'm hoping to wrap up with about 15 minutes okay. to go, so we'll have some, uh, some time. And there's what a map looks like. This is from some work um, uh, that I was involved with a, a couple years ago. Again, we had a contractor do most of this, but that's what a map looks like. This is Silver Glen, again, and you can see the majority of the um, plant beds are dominated by that val, by the freshwater eelgrass. Uh, this is the Juniper Club, a private hunting fishing club, kind of got a hydrilla dominated area right where they, uh, where they have their docks. And you can kind of see more, more grass cover downstream. Again, this is where the boats park, where the people tramp all over the place, so you can see the reduced uh, uh, cover there. And of course, you get numbers from this, uh, so there's the actual statistics from our, our mapping study. Five years earlier, a contractor for uh, Florida DEP um, mapped SAV in the run using pretty much the same methods our guys did. So you can compare and you can see not much difference over that five year period. The main thing was back then they mapped algae, the algal mats. Uh, we did not, if I do this again, I'll definitely map, map the algae to uh, keep track of that. Okay, so that's a bit about the plant communities and, and how we look at them and, and, and try to evaluate them. Let's talk about near and dear to my heart, benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, that word benthic means associated with the bottom, you know, living on or in the bottom habitat of uh, aquatic ecosystems like rivers or lakes or estuaries. Um, macro means big enough to see with the naked eye. You don't need some type of a microscope or other device to actually see them. And of course, an invertebrate is an animal without backbone. In freshwater ecosystems, most of the benthic invertebrates that you're going to see are going to be some kind of an aquatic insect. And that's these guys here. So you got your odonates, dragonflies and damselflies, mayflies, caddisflies, non-biting midges, uh, true bugs, beetles. And uh, we actually get some aquatic and semi-aquatic um, butterflies and moths. The caterpillar is what, what lives in the water. And then some of the other major groups are your crustaceans. Um, like your crayfish and grass shrimp and some little things, uh, sow bugs and scuds, snails and clams, the mollusks, and your aquatic worms, which are basically an aquatic version of an earthworm. Um, the benthic macroinvertebrate communities of spring runs are pretty much the same as what we see in other Florida flowing water ecosystems, the blackwater streams, uh, the big rivers of, of Florida. About the only real difference is that 
you, the relative abundance of the mollusks and the crustaceans tends to be higher in the spring run streams because they need calcium as a, as, a, as a physiological requirement. And of course, the spring water is very rich in calcium, dissolved calcium. The mollusks, of course, to build their shell, the crustaceans uh, for their exoskeleton, their skin. Um, some examples, OK, uh, ecological roles. The biggie is, is there our main, what we call primary consumer in the food web, the herbivore, plant eaters. Okay? Most of the plant material produced in the spring run streams is consumed by some type of a benthic macroinvertebrate. And so I like to think of them as um, you know, the little box, the charger box that you charge up your laptop or your cell phone with. They convert plant biomass to animal biomass, you know, just like that little box converts the AC power out of the outlet to uh, DC power to power your computer. They are a key element of faunal biodiversity. Typically, there's going to be more species of macroinvertebrates than fish, turtles, birds, mammals combined. Uh, so they're a very, very uh, diverse group in terms of the numbers of species or taxa. Some of them are key intermediate predators, like the um, uh, the odonates, the dragonflies and damselflies, they're predators. They prey on other invertebrates and even small fish. And a number of them are key algal grazers. And of course, they're the food for some of the stuff that we're more interested in, like, uh, like fish. Some examples, OK, these are some of the aquatic insects. <coughs> Most of the aquatic insects that we collect are the young form, the immature, uh, either a nymph or a larva. So, you know, damselfly and dragonfly nymphs, mayfly nymphs, caddisfly larvae, midge larvae. And then we do get others that live their whole life cycle in the water, so we get adults, like a lot of your aquatic beetles and um, the hemipterans, like water scorpion and, and giant water bug and, and that kind of thing. So there's aquatic insects. And then some of the other groups, uh, the crustaceans, so crayfish and grass shrimp, which you're probably familiar with, and then some smaller crustaceans, the scuds or amphipods and sow bugs or isopods. Most of these things are very, very tiny. Um, and then, of course, your, your uh, clams and, and your snails. Um, this is a rare picture. It's taken by my colleague, uh, Jody Slater, at uh, St. John's. Um, this is a female apple snail. This is a native laying her egg clutch. They usually come out at night, so you very rarely see them. You know, you just come out in the morning and suddenly you see egg clutches all over the place. Uh, but uh, in this case, Jody was out on Alexander Springs Creek early in the morning, and she saw this mama here kind of finishing up her, her chores. So it's a very rare picture. You, 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 won't, you don't see that very, very often. And these, of course, are freshwater mussels, but they're actually a clam. They're not related to the marine mussels like the middleus and such. Um, just they kind of look like a mussel, but they're actually a clam. So there's some examples, stuff we use to sample these guys. Um, of course, dip nets is really the most basic piece of equipment. Um, for soft bottom areas, various kinds of grabs and dredges to, to uh, pick up a piece of bottom. Um, Equipment that we can actually suspend in the water for two, three, four weeks, and then invertebrates colonize it, uh, simulating a piece of wood or something like that in the water. And then various diver-operated devices that you put over an area, and then you collect the material in the, in the mesh, mesh bag here. So looking at some of the data and some of the patterns that we see, this is from an old study uh, done in the 50s. This was a master's thesis at uh, University of Florida. And I believe this fellow, William Sloan, did work some with H.T. Odom in some of his work. He did some of the macroinvertebrate work for, for Odom in uh, Silver Springs and, and other springs. But typically what we see is the head spring area is, is pretty depauperated. It doesn't have a diversity of invertebrates because the dissolved oxygen coming out of the spring is, is very low, so there's not a lot of oxygen to support these guys. And then you get um, diversity increases as you go down the spring run. In the case of the Wikiwachi, we know it drains to the gulf. So as you get closer to the salty gulf water, the aquatic insects drop out because most of those are, are freshwater. Um, Homosassa, somewhat similar, although a fairly richer uh, invertebrate community in, um, in, uh, in Homosassa. I use the word taxa richness. It really, it means species richness, you know, the individual species of invertebrates. But in many cases, you can't identify these things down to species. 
Um, so we use the more general term taxa richness, basically just meaning the number of different kinds or species of invertebrates that you, you collect in your sample. Here's some data uh, that we collected last year from, uh, from Blue Spring uh, down in Volusia County near Orange City. Um, and we actually compared it. We used the same locations and the same methods that uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection did um, about uh, eight or nine years uh, earlier. Again, this is the tax richness of these benthic invertebrates. Blue Spring uh, is a very, very low dissolved oxygen spring, so we see a very, very species poor invertebrate community. These are, are really low numbers here. Um, but we do see the upper reach is right by the head spring. Middle reach is by the swim area, if you've ever been to Blue Spring. And then the lower reach is down near where it dumps into the St. John's River. And you can see the increasing taxa richness as you go downstream in our data. Um, that's because the spring run gets better oxygenated as it runs down towards the St. John's. Not quite the same at the DEP data. And a, a major element of the, the benthic macroinvertebrate fauna of spring runs is snails. This was some other sampling that we did in Blue Springs with um, Kirsten Work at Stetson University. Again, uh, we, we used the same locations and methods used by DEP back in 07, 08 uh, to compare our data with the earlier data. So this is the number of species of snails in Blue Spring. Uh, in general, we see it's kind of same thing, higher uh, different higher snail diversity in the middle and lower reaches of Blue Spring compared to the up near the head spring because of the low dissolved oxygen coming out of the ground there. Um, this is from some work I did at Swanee. We did some survey work in the Ishtuckney and this just kind of shows the general composition of we collected a total of 80 different taxa or different kinds of invertebrates from this preliminary sampling episode in the Ishtuckney. <laughs> about half of those were some kind of a aquatic insect. So again, as I mentioned, aquatic insects are kind of the dominant group in the benthic fauna of spring run streams. And then um, snails, 10 different taxa of snails, 14 different taxa of aquatic worms. So those are the other kind of major groups. And if you look at the actual number of individuals collected, the abundance of these different groups, you see pretty much the same thing. Um, mostly, uh, so, you know, at the head spring, we collected in this sample a little over a thousand individuals. Most of those were either a worm or a snail or a midge. And, and we see that also in the uh, rice marsh and the floodplain reaches. So that just gives you an idea of the composition of the, the benthic community. Mostly insects with crustaceans and mollusks and worms, kind of as your other major groups. Um, if you've got data like this of, you know, showing the abundance of the different groups, you can actually buy software packages, uh, fairly sophisticated mathematical techniques that compare locations or spring runs by looking at the composition of the macroinvertebrate community. And you get something called a, a cluster analysis, which it groups these things by similar communities. Um, these are the, this is from, uh, I showed you a little bit of plant data. This is this survey of 14 springs that we did a couple years ago. Uh, so this would be, you know, I can't move. So uh, Alexander Spring, uh, Gum Slough uh, down in um, Sumter County, I think, Ishtuckney, Juniper Creek, Rainbow River, Rock Springs Run, Silver River, Silver Glen Run, the Wasissa River out in Jefferson County, the Wakulla River, south of Tallahassee, Wikiwachi, and the Wakiva River. So these were the spring runs. And what this analysis did is it grouped these by the similarity of the invertebrate communities. The main thing is you got kind of this group out here. These are mostly the St. John's springs that are kind of the saltier springs. They have the higher dissolved solids content like Silver Glen and uh, Alexander Spring. And then these are more the calcium carbonate type springs like Rainbow and Silver and Ishtuckney. They kind of grouped out separately. Although for the life of me, I don't know why these are the two Wakiva River stations, why it sort of separated them out. There must be the occurrence of, of one or two groups of invertebrates that make those communities a little different. So that's the kind of thing this cluster analysis tells you. The one interesting thing about the benthic invertebrate communities of springs uh, are the endemics. In particular, there's a group of snails, the family Hydrobiidae, the, the silt snails. Uh, a number of species are found only in, 
in one spring. Like, uh, and these are the genera that contain some of these, like Blue Spring uh, near Orange City has two species of these snails. They've got Floridobia parva, the um, pygmy silt snail, and they've got Aphaeus strachan asthenes, the Blue Spring hydrobe. They're only found in Blue Spring, nowhere else. Uh, Fred Thompson, uh, uh, the late Fred Thompson, he died a, a year or so ago, um, was the guy who first described a lot of these things in Florida Springs. He was a researcher at the Florida Museum of Natural History in, uh, in Gainesville. Um, Ishtuckney nearby, uh, Coffee Spring, that most downstream spring on the Ishtuckney, um, has Floridobia mica, the Ishtuckney uh, sand grain snail, which again is only found in Coffee Spring, nowhere else in the world. There's another snail, it's in a different group, it's in the Pleurosurid uh, family, uh, the goblin alemia. Uh, it's found typically only in the uh, springs of the St. John's, although evidently it's been introduced to Ishtuckney. Uh, it is a native, it's not exotic, um, but they do collect it in, uh, in Ishtuckney. And nobody really knows how it got there, but somebody must have brought it there. And then in these submerged cave systems, uh, you know, that, that feeding these, these springs, You've got a very unique fauna uh, that over the hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, they've lost their pigment. Um, some of these things have lost their eyes, they're blind. Um, mostly various crayfish species as, as shown uh, here. Again, some of these things are only associated with one spring or one spring group. Uh, we do get one uh, shrimp, the squir squirrel chimney cave shrimp, found at only one location, a solution sink, I believe in southern Suwannee County, might be wrong on that. And we get a couple species of cave amphipods and cave isopods, same thing, they're albino, uh, their eyes are very, very reduced, living in that lightless environment. So, so um, that's the main thing about the spring benthic communities is the endemics and the, uh, the cave fauna. Um, before we leave benthic invertebrates, I'll show you another rare picture because we don't see these guys very much. This is the, uh, the river prawn. It's a shrimp. Prawn is the European name for shrimp. Uh, over in Europe, they call them prawns. Over here, we call them shrimp. This is the giant river prawn. Um, it is native. It's, it's uh, here in Florida, uh, only typically found, as far as we know, in the St. John's. And it tends to mainly like the spring run streams. He's nocturnal. He only comes out at night to forage. During the day, he'll go down into the uh, caves with the springs or find somewhere under a rock or a log. Um, this guy here, uh, Larry there, lives on the lower Wakaiva River, and he had some fish traps out one night to um, trap some minnows for, or, or uh, shiners for bass bait, and he came out to his traps, and uh, this guy was in, in one of the traps. And nobody knew who it was, what the heck it was. Nobody had ever seen it. Uh, but Deb Shelley, the aquatic preserve manager down there, Larry sent her these pictures and she sent it to me and she says, Rob, what the heck is this thing? And I, as soon as I saw it, I said, that's what it is. It's the, uh, it's the river prawn. Again, very rare that you see those guys because um, formerly quite abundant on the Silver Springs, Silver River system. Uh, evidently not as abundant now as, as they, they used to be, but they used to see them at night, you know, crawling around. Um, also been seen at Silver, Sp uh, Silver Glen Spring, and of course, we know now that they're on the Wakaiva, too. Okay, fish communities. Um, kind of similar to the benthic invertebrates, nothing particularly unique about the spring-run fish communities. They're the same as what you see in other um, Florida river systems, basically dominated by the big four here, your bass and brim, uh, minnows and shiners, the killifish, and your live bears, which are your mosquito fish and sailfin molly and such. And then we get gar, a couple species of darters, bowfin or mudfish, eel, and then the catfish and the mad tums. Let's go ahead. Has anybody heard Captain Skipper Lockett from Rainbow do his spiel? Okay, if you haven't, so we're gonna, so the Rainbow River used to be private and they had a boat tour, kind of like the, instead of the glass bottom boats, it was a submarine boat. You went down into the hole and sat down and you were looking out a porthole below the water surface. So here's Skipper's thing when he would talk to his, his uh, boat customers. Like birds playing with the egg, and the tub looked like cattle rolling on the floor. 
When you look up to the top of the water, it looks like the skies above. Now, the growing of the vegetation, it looks like the growing of the trees. Then bomb looks like a hillside after a snowstorm. And rainbow spring looks to the top like a wall of the stone. All right, now, folks, in this river, we've got 37 varieties of fish. We've got 47 varieties of vegetation. Really, more than any one man could give you by name. But here are some of the vegetation that you'll see in the Rainbow River. We've got foxtail fern, got mullet hair, got college grass, got tall grass, got single tent, got double tent, got water shamrock, got rose fern, got water fern, got water rose, got psychic tent, got water crab, got so many variety of vegetation, I couldn't give them all to you by name. Now there's over 40 varieties of fish in the Rainbow River. So here are some of the fish we give you by name that you will see on your boat trip to the Rainbow River. We've got live mouth bass, got a big mouth black bass, got a calico bass, got small mouth bass, got a blue here, we've got a shell cut, got a sand duck, got china, we've got a leopard dog, got a mud pig, got a jackfish, five fish, little pig, got a sun foot, got a red tail foot, got a woman foot, we've got a speckled foot, got a blue shad, got a silver shad, got a German cock, got a common head trim, got a mud cat, china cat, pickle cat, red cat, red eyes, a black dog, got an alligator dog, got a roach, got a golden cock. Then big John L. Lewis, that big 20 pound bag. Now John L. Lewis, the fish money couldn't buy. The men came landing and the women don't try. Now folks that keep the people look foolish like <laughs> Enjoy the beauty just there and say. Most amazing sight you've ever seen for the day that she goes is Severine. And the day you rolls off down the stream, she come before you just like a dream. But folks, it's not a dream. You're looking at rainbow spring with a natural life. So I'll say goodbye, call back, feel it again. You're watching it all the time at the famous rainbow spring. So that was his, uh, and you can get that. Uh, the uh, Florida Department of State has audio archives. You can you can get that. Uh, and I also have the guys uh, who used to do the boats at Wakulla, the uh, tour boats at Wakulla as well. So, but the fish community is pretty much the same as we see in other um, Florida flowing water ecosystems, rivers and and streams. Um, of course, ecological roles of fish mainly they're important predators. You know, mostly. Um, the uh, uh, most fish feed on invertebrates, you know, or on their fishy brothers. Uh, so they're important predators, and of course, predation is an important organizing force in uh, in ecosystems. Uh, of course, they themselves are food for other things: birds, otter, alligators, snapping turtles. And again, they're an element of the biodiversity in the uh, in the spring run streams. How am I doing on time? We doing doing good? Okay, okay. Some of the fish. Um, Largemouth bass, like uh, Skipper said, gar, uh, the various brim, like bluegill. Uh, we do get some exotics, uh, tilapia, this is uh, an exotic fish, uh, and eel. Um, like the uh, river prawn, the eels are nocturnal. They'll come out at night um, and forage their predators, but during the day, typically they'll head down into the spring caves. Uh, this picture is by Christy, and she was down at the bottom of the natural well in. Um, uh, Silver Glen Spring. That's that little secondary vent in Silver Glen. Um, just some fish data. These data were collected by Steve Walsh, who's uh, on the Technical Advisory Committee for this uh, institute. Um, but this is from some survey work he did with Jim Williams in a variety of springs. And the, the, there's various ways to collect fish, but in a clear water system like the springs, the best way is just to jump in with a mask and snorkel and inventory them, you know, identify, count them, as, as, you, uh, as you swim along down the, down the spring, very similar to what's used on coral reef fish surveys. So these were the number of different species or taxa of fish that uh, Steve and Jim saw in the different spring runs. That's the green to try to get some kind of historical context. What they did, uh, the uh, yellow bars are fish records from these springs uh, in the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, so they, they compared that, and in general, um, realizing that that's not totally the best way to do any kind of a historical comparison, but that's what they had. And in general, they, they observed and, and found as, as about as many fish species or more as has historically been recorded uh, based on the museum records. And you can see some are better than others. Ishtuckney, uh, fairly species rich, uh, Wakulla. Uh, this is some data that um, Kirsten Work and Missy Gibbs at Stetson uh, collected in Blue Spring. And this is pretty typical of fish data, very, very variable, very highly variable. This is the number of fish taxa that they observed. Main thing is their station one is right up by the Blue Spring head spring. Their station five is downstream near where the run goes into the St. Johns River. Uh, very few fish up near the head spring, again, because of the very low dissolved oxygen. The main stuff they see up there at the head spring are 
the live bears like mosquito fish, which they have this odd little upturned mouth so they can respire right at the water surface, you know, where the oxygen level is, is high enough. And then some of your air breathing things like gar, which can take a bubble of air, and that's how they help respire. Fish abundance, extremely variable, and that's pretty typical of, of, of fish data. Um, the one unique thing about the fish communities of Florida springs and spring runs would be the phenomenon known as marine invasions. And again, H.T. Odom kind of first sort of recognized and described this phenomenon uh, back in the 50s, whereby marine things are able to invade upriver and, and come into these spring systems, in particular the St. John's spring runs and Homosassa over on the Gulf Coast are particularly noted for marine invasions because of the saltier nature of, of those springs. But these are, are some of the species. These two guys, stripers and American shad, those are our salmon. Those are our anadromous fishes. They live in the ocean, but they run up the rivers to spawn. And then these are some other things that just kind of incidentally use the, the rivers. There's uh, some stripers in, uh, in Silver Glen. Does anybody know what these guys are? You recognize these guys? Tarpon. Those are, I took that picture. Those are tarpon in Blue Spring up near Orange City. They're about that big. Okay? I, I, I asked the park manager if I could bring my fly rod out the next time, and he said no, no fishing. So. But uh, yes, so, and, and the um, Stetson folks, Kirsten and Missy, confirmed that during the wintertime, they regularly see tarpon in, uh, in Blue Spring Run. So yeah, quite. Other vertebrates, um, really quickly, turtles, alligators, uh, amphibians, various frogs and sirens. Probably the signature amphibian for the spring runs is the pig frog, which is a larger frog. They do gig them for frog legs. And uh, you know, as you're going by a marsh area like pickleweed and all, and you hear that, that's, that's the pig frog, OK? Uh, so you hear them more than see them. And then the sirens, again, they're nocturnal usually. They're a, a type of a legless salamander. Birds, various uh, fish feeding birds and then mammals like otter and, and Florida manatee. And there's the biggest Florida snapper I've ever seen. That came out of the Silver River from some of the work we're doing with the uh, University of Florida. Um, turtle survey work, um, uh, there's a fairly extended record on the Rainbow River, uh, mainly done by uh, Dr. Peter Malin at uh, Eckerd College down in St. Pete. And I know the Wakiva River, a fellow named Muncher or Muncher, he's got some long-term turtle survey work he's been doing on the Wakiva. Uh, down near Orlando. But, um, so this is from some data that, uh, that Pete's collected with his students. This is a 1942 study, and back then the turtle community was dominated in Rainbow River largely by the cooters. Uh, this would be uh, the river cooter and the Florida cooter. Uh, when Pete started doing his work, uh, the system was more dominated by the musk turtles, the loggerhead musk and the stink pot uh, uh, turtle largely because he thinks, you know, unrestricted harvest. People harvest the cooters for food, to make soup out of them or to fry them up. Uh, whereas now, with the Rainbow Springs State Park and the Aquatic Preserve, there's a lot of restrictions on the harvest. And um, so you can kind of see they've been recovering to some extent. The uh, proportional abundance of these guys, uh, of the cooters, has been, been coming back. And then, dare I say, the, the iconic mammal of the Florida Springs would be the manatee, which they use spring runs throughout the year as a foraging area. But in particular, in the wintertime, uh, they need, uh, when the St. John's drops below 20 degrees centigrade, the manatees of the St. John's run into uh, the uh, Blue Spring because they need this warm water refuge. Below 20 causes them all sorts of physiological problems. Um, and the same is true of, of, of course, Kings Bay, Crystal River, over on the Gulf Coast. The manatee is a tropical mammal, and it needs warm water up here at the northern end of its range uh, during the winter time, and that's the spring runs. Um, since the late 70s, the rangers at Blue Springs State Park, uh, particularly Ranger Wayne Hartley, who's retired now, have been doing manatee counts, and you can see a success story here that uh, a uh, good population increase of the manatee population using Blue Spring in the wintertime. And actually, um, they did some projections a few years ago of the uh, projected growth rate of the manatee population using Blue Spring, and we've been exceeding that projection pretty regularly since uh, the mid-2000s. Uh, mid 
And then ecosystem metabolism. So I'm getting almost done. Maybe five more minutes. Um, so again, H.T. Odom um, recognized in the 50s that in flowing water ecosystems, that's what that word lodic means, rivers, streams, spring runs, oxygen is produced during the day by photosynthesis, by plant activity, and then both during the day and at night, oxygen is consumed by respiratory processes. Using upstream downstream measurements over a 24 hour period, you can actually estimate rates of, of plant production, primary production, and community respiration as grams oxygen per meter squared per day. And initially, he actually worked on this methodology on a number of, of Florida springs. And so there's some data from Silver Springs, most of which has been collected by Bob, which was uh, uh, one of uh, Odom's students. So this is from his, uh, so this is gross primary production, which is the total amount of organic carbon produced by the plants, by the primary producers in the spring run. And this is mainly the submerged plants, the, the macrophytes, the algae, the mosses. Um, so this was what Odom did in the 50s in his studies of Silver Springs. This was Bob's uh, PhD dissertation, and then some subsequent work. Um, and you can kind of see some variation from, from year to year uh, due to factors like the amount of sunlight uh, and, and, and flow and, and other things. And there's some other work that Bob did uh, comparing GPP in a number of spring runs across the, the state. Uh, the, the bluish is sort of up by the head spring, and the purplish is down in the spring run. You can see the silver, manatee, rainbow, pretty highly productive. Um, some of these others less so, in part due to the presence or absence of uh, the submerged grass beds, the macrophytes. Generally, the macrophyte-dominated systems are more productive, although manatee is largely dominated by algae. So. And then, OK, how do we put all this together, the plants, the animals, this uh, gross primary production and net production and such. Ecologists, and again, H.T. Odom first kind of took this view of ecosystems. We can sort of take a, a ecosystem and build a pyramid. So at the base of the pyramid, you've got your plants, your primary producers, okay? Which, you know, this is it. They're producing biomass as this plant biomass is this gross primary production. Okay, in a spring run, this of course is a terrestrial food web, but in a spring run, of course, that's going to be your algae, your moss, your submerged vegetation, and your emergent vegetation, and the decaying plant material. Uh, that's the primary producer level. Trophic here means feeding. So these are the different feeding levels. So there's the primary producers. Then you got your primary consumers, your herbivores, which in a spring run is mostly your benthic invertebrates, with a few fish and some turtles, and of course manatees, which are, are, are grazers. Then you start to get your predators. You've got your secondary consumers, which feed on these guys down here. So you've got fish, which are feeding on the invertebrates, some other turtles and such. Um, and then you've got your tertiary or top level consumers, which feed on, on, on both of these levels. Okay? So that's kind of how we look at it. This is basically the same diagram done by H.T. Odom in Silver Springs. He just sort of expressed it in a different way. Here's sunlight. Here's the primary producers, okay? So this base of the pyramid. And then, now this is their gross primary production here. Now they themselves consume some of that. The plants have their own metabolic needs. So that what comes out is what we call net primary production. That's consumed by the herbivores, the primary consumers. And then the uh, first tier carnivores, the secondary consumers, and then your tertiary or top consumers. So you get this flow of that plant energy um, through and up that, that food web pyramid. Okay? Uh, and one of the ways we look at this stuff these days is um, with the improvements in chemistry and stuff, we actually look at the ratios of different isotopic forms of carbon and nitrogen. This is a New Zealand study. Uh, on a fairly simple food web. But what you see is as you go from that base of the pyramid up to the top, you get this shift up and to the right of these carbon-nitrogen ratios. Uh, so there's your primary producers, there's your herbivores, primary consumers, secondary and tertiary or top consumers. And you get this shift in this direction. The reason I show you that is we've been doing a ton of work with University of Florida over the past three years, and they did the same thing in Silver River. So you can see, see the shift up and to the, to the, to the right. And so there's your primary producers. They use these carbon-nitrogen uh, ratios 
to um, delineate the food web in Silver River, mainly to see what's eating those nuisance algal mats that, we, that we're seeing. And the answer is not a whole lot. But so here's the primary producers, the plants. These are the different groups. These are the nuisance algae, the mat forming algae. These are the algae that don't form big mats, but you see them in, in little clumps. This is the submerged vegetation with its epiphytes, the algae growing on it. And this is the emergent vegetation. Then you see the herbivores, the primary consumers at that next level. Then in this case, we kind of got a mixed level of things that eat both plant and animal material, the omnivores. Then you got your secondary, your predators, that's the orange, little diamonds. And then you got your top, uh, top level carnivores, top predators, which are things like gar, chain pickerel, uh, the water snakes, and that's actually a water moccasin. What was interesting from this work is it's usually assumed that an alligator is up there at the very top of the food web pyramid, but the alligators in Silver River are mainly eating apple snails and crayfish, so they're almost functioning more like a, like a secondary consumer. So that's kind of how we put all that stuff together, the plants and the animals, and look at how it, uh, how it works. Um, why spring biology is important is alterations in water quality uh, and hydrology are not always readily apparent to the, to the eye. Really what we see are the biological changes. Now I know last month you talked about water quality in the academy here and probably you talked about the increases we're seeing in nitrate in, uh, in these spring run systems. Nitrate is normally extremely low concentrations. Background is, is less than 0.1 parts per million, typically around 0.05 or so. But so many of our springs, we've been seeing these significant increases in nitrate concentration. You can't taste nitrate or smell it or see it, but um, what you see is the biological effect. What we've seen in a lot of springs, which we believe nitrate is a factor, this progression from a um, macrophyte dominated system with the flowering rooted uh, grasses to these uh, nuisance algal mats, these benthic filamentous algal mats. That's Wikiwachi between the 50s and, and uh, you know, more recent. And even if you don't lose the, the macrophytes, you see other changes. This is Silver River. Of course, there's a, a Bruce Moser picture. That's the Sagittaria in the background. Look at the blades, you know, kind of nice and clean. Just have a little coating maybe of, of algae, which is an important part of the primary production. But nowadays, you see the much higher burdens of, of that epiphytic algae uh, growing on the, on, the, on, the, on the plant blades. So the biology really helps you understand, you know, why things like nitrate increases are uh, significant and of concern. And that's going to be it. I hope we've got some time left for some questions and discussion. I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to think of it now, but you, I, I guess you touched on it towards the end there. When, when earlier in the presentation where you had some slides on, on the, the increase in plants. Right. And I guess the, the algae is part of the SAV that was showing the increase. And when you have that increase in algae, that's not a good thing, right? No, no, no. no right. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a quality. Yeah. issue when you have an overabundance of algae in the system. Algae is not as good a habitat, and, and it's, for some invertebrates, it's, it's a better food source than the macrophytes, but for others, not. So is it coming in because of nutrient changes? In part, uh, nutrients. Uh, in part, possibly the, the declines in snail populations, because they're the grazers. They're the ones that kind of help keep the algae crop back. Did you say the striped bass or the striped mullet or something was coming up? Mullet, mullet are, are herbivores, um, but based on some of the UF work, that food web work, they, they're really eating the, um, the more microscopic algae. You know, like at Silver Glen, I've seen them prop off the end of a, of a grass blade, and they just kind of, so they're just kind of cleaning off the, the algae. I've seen them pulling up algae, the uh, mat forming algae, the filamentous algae. But I don't think they're eating that. I think they're just cleaning off the microscopic algae growing on the filamentous algae. So I guess your one picture there towards the end was silver springs, where of course, you know, there's a there's a uh, obstruction as far as the run for mullet from the St. John's River to make it up right. to silver springs. Yes, mullet used to be a lot more abundant before uh, before Rodman. Rodman, right, right. right. So so I guess uh, they're a key component to They could be, system. yes. Yeah as far as controlling the algae. They could help, yeah. And we're actually sort of considering that as to you know, be another reason to get rid of Robin, to get more mullet up into Silver Springs to get more grazing. Any 
the other. Go ahead. Well, one of the other fish that didn't figure so prominently in your list, but behaves like mullet, is the spotted sucker. Ah, okay. And they're uh, they're also a, primarily a vegetarian, an omnivore vegetarian. They yeah. they will mouth and pull up the uh, algae, whether they're actually consuming it or not is a question. Yeah. But those two species. Striped mullet and spotted sucker are, in a lot of the swanee springs, are the dominant fishes. Now. I mean, some of the others you could you could do a circuit of post springs up here and count ten sunfish. Maybe everything else is going to be suckers. Mm -hmm. Have they looked at comparing the flavor of the water and the amount of nitrogen? Is the, the slower flow causing um, like more algae blooms? Okay, two things there. Let's talk, yes, there's been, we've done some work at St. John's, I know Swanee's done some work comparing spring flow and nitrate concentrations, and it sort of varies. Some springs display a, what we'll call a positive relationship. At higher flow, higher nitrate concentrations, which kind of suggests that a lot of that nitrate is coming in with young water, new water, some springs don't show any relationship between flow and nitrate, and a few show a negative relationship, lower nitrate at higher flow, which kind of means that more of the nitrate's coming in with the older water, because at lower flow, more of that spring flow is older water. Um, that could be a factor in the algae. What is a little more important in terms of flow in algae is the flow itself helps scrape away algae, you know, through physical sloughing and removal. And to the extent that a lot of our springs have been losing flow, that means the current is less. It's really the current velocity that strips away algae. Again, there's been some work done down in Gum Slough that uh, it appears that current seems to be the, the big thing there, um, driving algal abundance in, in Gum Slough. 